Good morning, Taylor University. Good morning. Well, thank you for coming today to chapel on a cold, wet uh, Halloween day. Um, my name is Chip. Uh, thank you. And I have the privilege of introducing the speaker today. Uh, but before I introduce the speaker, I just want to share with you a few uh, quick announcements. Uh, the speaker today will be uh, also sharing uh, tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, Osborne East and West uh, at the TU lead on the on the subject of uh, vocational faithfulness. And so for those of us that are participating in TU LEAD, uh, you're invited, and anybody else who's interested in that, uh, you're in invited to come tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, also Wednesday, empty bowls. Uh, there will be plenty of homemade nice empty, uh, and all kinds of bowls that will be empty, but there will be also uh, soup. So we pray that you participate with us on that. And then on Friday evening at 7 here in the uh, campus center, we'll have an event. Uh, it's called Bearing Witness uh, and Serving uh, Those Displaced Amongst Ourselves. So we invite you to participate on that and engage the world in that way. Uh, so now it's my privilege to introduce the speaker for today. Uh, Esther Mwaniki is coming to us uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Esther is a strategic uh, risk management professional who is passionate about civic engagement and leadership development. She has experience over 17 years um, serving organizations in Kenya uh, and globally. Uh, the Obama Foundation, uh, Oprah Winfrey Foundation, the Africa Leadership Initiative, a grantee of the Ford Foundation, have awarded her uh, several awards for exemplary uh, leadership and civic innovation. She's currently serving as the founder and CEO of Lapids uh, Leaders Africa. And so last week she came all the way from Nairobi, Kenya and rested a few days so she could be here today. And uh, Lapid uh, Leaders Africa is an organization that prepares Africa's workforce to be exceptional, uh, values-driven leaders in the marketplace. Um, Esther is a successful uh, marketplace uh, leader. And over the last eight years, she's overseen the organization's overall management, uh, including but not limited to providing strategic direction, developing and implementing the curriculum, and entering into partnerships that supported the institution's growth. She has developed several curriculums that are anchored on pan-African ethos. Through uh, ingenuity, commitment to excellent uh, creativity, and servant leadership, she has built one of Africa's top leadership development programs, Lapid Leaders Africa, from scratch. Uh, Esther also recently completed an executive master's in public administration at New York University, and is passionate about the growth and development of social impact-driven organizations. She enjoys working with people, tackling problems in startup, uh, startups and complex environments, and help these organizations build the systems and structures that can support their growth. So Taylor University, uh, this morning, would you help me in uh, giving a nice, warm welcome to our speaker today, Esther Moniki. Morning, Taylor. So in Kenya, we like loud voices. So when I say good morning, you guys will tell me good morning with a lot of energy. That will help me to start well. Is that okay? So good morning, Taylor. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Chip, for that uh, fantastic introduction. Um, and it's such an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, allow me to start with a word of prayer. Father, we we decrease and we ask that you may increase in this moment, Lord. That God, as we start this conversation, Father, would your spirit hover in this place, Lord? I thank you because of this moment that we are in, Father. That God, you've created it, Lord. Holy Spirit of God, I welcome you here. That Father, I would decrease and that you would increase. That Jehovah God, all of us would decrease and that you would increase. Minister to us, we ask, Lord, that God, this would not be just another meeting that we are in, but your power and your presence, Lord, would minister to us. We welcome you, Spirit of God. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. So thank you again, Chip, for that introduction and for allowing me to be able to speak to you. Um, as Chip said, my name is Esther Moniki. Um, I come with many titles, but at the end of the day, the most important thing I do is I'm a child of the king. I'm a born-again Christian who loves the Lord very much and who is driven. Everything about me is driven by that, that God would establish his purposes in my life. And today I want to speak up from the title of A Chosen Generation. And I spent this past weekend on Saturday, and I want to just honor Sarah. Thank you for showing me around this town. Um, and just taking in a bit of you, a town. I haven't I've been to US, and I've primarily visited big cities, and so I've been to New York, Chicago, and the likes. But just being here felt like home. I grew up in a small town in Kenya called Thika. It's bigger now, but I resonate with small towns. I love the air of small town. I feel like it's different from big cities. I love the warmth in uh, small towns, and I felt that as I walked around. I could sense the warmth of the town and of the city. I could sense the love, and I'm very grateful to be among you guys. Um, I also spent quite a bit of time I am a student, so I like learning, and I spent quite a bit of time reading through your history, and I was um, blown away by a few things. At the heart of it was um, the name Taylor, and Bishop uh, Taylor, who the school is named after, and I was taken by the fact that he was also known as a missionary for Africa, and that started to tell me, I can tell the heart of Africa in the school, and so I could I was intrigued by the fact that he was known as um, the missionary, a missionary in Africa. I like the book that he wrote, Flaming Torch um, of Dark Africa. I haven't read it, but the name Lapid means Flaming Torch in Hebrew. And so when I started Lapid Leaders Africa, it was from a call of how do we raise a generation that will be a flaming torch in Africa. And so I resonated with the book that he's written from a title perspective, I haven't read it, and just told me the spirit behind the university to be a flaming torch in Africa and in the world. But I also admired the story of Samuel Morris. That they, yeah, thank you. That we have hosted Africans here. Um, and the spirit of just generosity that allowed us to welcome him here. Um, and I, I just sensed the connection between Taylor and Africa, and it's a strong connection. And it was, it's just a privilege for me to be part of that. And so my prayer is, as we talk about a chosen generation, that, that God flames our hearts for this land and for Africa and for the world um, is where I'm coming from as we have this conversation. But I want to set a few pace, and I want just to give a bit of background before we talk about a, just, a chosen generation. Um, you will allow me to um, not be very sure about what I'm saying, but I will, yeah, sure, we've moved, yes. So I wanted to start there, um, and this is just to set a pace to where I'm going with this conversation around a chosen generation. We're coming from one of the greatest uh, moments, and for all intents and purposes, is likely to be a defining moment for our generation, the pandemic. Um, and in its goodness and its badness, what it has done is for many people, it's termed as the great reset. That there's a way that our way of thinking has changed because of the pandemic, one way or another. And so we are coming from a moment where the pandemic will always be a defining moment in our generation. It's, in some spaces, it's only comparable to what's called the Spanish flu pandemic, which was over 100 years ago. But what it has done is it has accelerated the pace at which some spaces, and especially in the developing world, that we are taking up the digital. Um, so sort of the digital economy was accelerated. Um, you have an increase in terms of social emotional reflections, and we are asking questions that perhaps wouldn't have been possible without the pandemic. I was in New York for most of last year and uh, early this year, and one of the things that we kept spending time on was around the great resignation, and sort of how the pandemic made people start to ask, is that is this where I want to work? And I want to also appreciate, I visited your career and calling office and I was intrigued by the name of career and calling. I think at the heart of the great resignation is that we've not been able to connect those two, career and calling. And I love the fact that here we are having conversations not just about careers, but careers and calling. And I think the pandemic allowed us to move to that level of that conversation, to say, is this what we wanna be able to do? Am I working? Um, am I living? Can I do both? And I think those are important questions that people are asking today. And at the 
I'm a student of business, and within the business world, you're hearing a lot of these three eras coming through a lot. And so there's a conversation around a lot of what we live by today was built during the industrial era. Um, and what the digital world did is it ushered us into the knowledge era. And so there is easy access to knowledge, there is easy access to information. But then there's a lot of conversations that we are headed to the post-knowledge era. And what the knowledge era enabled us to see is a lot of information without the container to hold the information can be dangerous. And so there's a lot more conversations around how do we build the emotional capacity, the emotional experiences within the businesses to be able to handle the post-knowledge era. And so just basically that there's a lot of change that's going on within our generation. But the thing that I like about those transitions is that none of these transitions is a shock to our God. That this pandemic, this business transitions, this post-knowledge era, none of it is a shock to our God. They still fit into God's wider purpose, which is to draw man back to himself. And that mission has never changed. But to be able to do that, we need to have a new wineskin to hold the changes that will continue to emerge. And when you think about the new wineskin, what it says is that we can't survive using the old kind of thinking. There's a new way that God is requiring us to think. And so the old wineskin wine has assumed a definite shape, and it's no longer pliable. It's fixed, it's somehow brittle. But you can't put new uh, wine into old mindsets, and you can't get new results with old behaviors. And so the question we have to ask at this point of transition is what is God doing? And what does it look like for us to have a new wineskin? And what does it look like for us to be a chosen generation that has worn that new wineskin? And I think the first place is to recognize that we are chosen. We are chosen for a moment such as this. But what are we chosen to be? What are we chosen to do? Um, and I like that slide because it represents what I believe is God's agenda, what has always been God's agenda, that God is redeeming the world to himself, that the mission does not change. But if people expected this to look familiar to what God has done before, we would miss it. And so when we say we are chosen, we are the generation that has to wear the new wine skin. We are chosen to do the same thing, it's never changed, but we have to wear the new wine skin. To establish God's kingdom, that mission hasn't changed. But what does that mean? What does it mean to establish God's kingdom? And the next slide has some points that I really love. When I think about establishing God's kingdom, what comes for me is it's a kingdom established in love. It's a kingdom established by love. It's a kingdom that understands that what God says as the greatest commandment to them all is enough. That love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. To submit to nothing but him. And because of that love, we love our neighbors. We love ourselves. We reflect the love of Christ to each other. We reflect the love of Christ to ourselves. And because of that, we know the power of love. We know the enoughness of love. I'm not even sure the word enoughness is a real word, but I wanna go with it. And I think that's what God calls us as he's establishing this kingdom. That in a conflicted and conflicting world, to know that love is patient, to know that love is kind, to know that love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, always. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. I love that verse. Because for me, it takes me back to what is important. A kingdom established by love, a kingdom established in love, and a kingdom where love is defined. And I love that definition. And that's the big assignment of today. That as we think about ourselves as a chosen de generation, it's to ask, what does it look like for us to establish a kingdom established by love and in love? To establish God's kingdom on earth. How do we do it? Where do we start? Where are the notes for us establishing that kind of kingdom? And I find that the Bible has those notes. And I wanted to share some practical lessons around just how do we go about establishing that kingdom and use uh, the story of Elijah in First Kings as our teacher this morning. 
And I want to read 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46, which is one of my favorite uh, records in the Bible. And it says that then Elijah said to Ahab, it's 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. And um, I will repeat it again because it's not in the slides that it's 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. I really love that verse because there has been a drought, but Elijah hears a mighty rainstorm coming. So Elijah said to Ahab, I read again, go get something to eat. So he sends Ahab out, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed, down to, bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out at the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I don't see anything. Seven times, Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah and he tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. And the question I want us to sit with this morning is what does it look like for us to establish God's kingdom on earth? What does it look like for us to establish a kingdom by love, built by love and in love? And I find that those four points are what Elijah teaches us around how we establish that kingdom. The first thing is it starts with a purpose and a strong sense of purpose at that. I got baptized in UK. I worked in UK for a few years, um, between 2009 and 2011. And at the end of that season, I got baptized. And I remember the word God gave me then we were a group of people who were being baptized and I was called and given a word that was, it's based on John 15, 16. And it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. And as I think about a chosen generation, that's what comes to mind. Taylor, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. At the time when that word was said, I did not know its importance, but in my spirit, I sensed its importance. Chosen. In the years that followed, I started feeling a calling towards ministry. I was successful in my career. I was working uh, with PricewaterhouseCoopers in UK. I was on the pipeline towards being an audit partner. We didn't have enough women who were in leadership, and so I was in an accelerated path. But in my spirit, I knew I wanted more. And the firm that I was working with tried to get me to sit in and I got a lot of phenomenal assignments. I remember consulting for the largest banks in UK. I remember consulting for the merger of banks in Kenya, but it still wasn't enough. And then one day God gave me a vision. And that vision was to start Lapid Leaders Africa, to work with Africa's youth, to ignite their prowess, to equip them with skills to succeed in the marketplace, to use that as a stepping stone towards them being change makers in Africa. They would build socioeconomic solutions across Africa. They would be the light, the flaming torch, not just in Africa, but across the world. At that time, the vision was ridiculous. I still think it's ridiculous. But that's what Elijah's vision is, that they've been in a drought in a long period of time. But God gives Elijah a new sight, that the mighty rainstorm is coming. There has been a drought for three years, yet he sees rain. And so the first thing that I find in terms of establishing God's kingdom is sight. That God would give us a sense of purpose. That as a chosen generation, to establish God's kingdom on earth, we have to have a clear and audacious, an audacious vision. But that can only come from God. And I always tell people if you're called as a chosen generation, but your vision is something you can do by yourself, go back to God. 
the visions that God gives, they are ridiculous. They are like Esther's of a generation that can change Africa. They are like Elijah's of rain in a drought season. If you can do it by yourself, keep seeking God. The, this vision is one of rain in a drought. I wanna say that this country is in a drought season. I want to say that the world is in a drought season. We are in the middle of a spiritual drought. We're in the middle of a political drought. We're in the middle of a social drought. We're in the middle in some spaces of an economic drought. That God would show the chosen generation that in the midst of that drought, a mighty rainstorm is coming. Please tell your neighbor, a mighty rainstorm is coming. You guys don't believe it. The way you're telling your neighbor doesn't sound convincing. The first step towards building is having a specific purpose, a specific vision that only God can give you. What does God show you? What areas of drought has God showed you? A mighty rainstorm is coming. The second thing I hear from Elijah is pray and push. Elijah sees and then he tells Ahab, go drink and eat. And we have to do the same thing. We have to tell the world, go eat and drink. But we do what Elijah did. We get on our knees and we pray. There is no getting out of a drought without you on your knees. I am so challenged by what Elijah did. He has sight, he has a vision ahead, but he chooses first to send Ahab to eat and drink. Because that work cannot be done when Ahab is in front of him. And then next he gets on his knees and prays. Chosen people of God. When God shows you a vision, send Ahab to eat and drink. But get on your knees. God's kingdom is established on your knees. I still remember the second workshop. So I left employment in 2014 for my employment and chose to spend the rest of my life as God leads in building Lapid Leaders Africa. And I was naive enough and still am to believe that God is able to raise a generation of leaders within the continent. But I still remember the second workshop we had. And the first workshop was very successful. We had a room full of young leaders, did phenomenal work. The second workshop, we had eight people I will never forget. And I remember asking God, you removed me from employment to come and do this with eight people. I could have done that in my office. And I remember going to the toilet to ask God, really, is this the assignment? And I will never forget hearing very clearly, I will build my house. And no gates of hell will prevail against it. But I remember hearing the word, I will build my house. Chosen people of God. Only God can bring rain in a drought. Get on your knees. The spiritual revival needed in this country, the social revival, the political revival, the economic revival cannot be built by anyone else but God. And getting on our pushing position, you know, Elijah gets on a position where he prays and he pushes because that's a position that births God's kingdom. The third thing I hear is the power of process. God's chosen people, every rain needs a seed on the ground. And that seed is only built by time. We are the generation that fights with time. We are blessed because we have resources and capacity to do things faster. But God's kingdom is built by process. By the persistent and faithful servants the reason I love that record is Elijah was on his knees, but he had a nameless servant who ran seven times to check whether the rain has formed. Seven times. We are the generation that struggles with hard things, 
And I always ask myself, in which time would I have quit? Remember, first time, go run, there's no rain. Second time, go run, there's no rain. Third time, fourth time, I start to think, this vision that Elijah has is ridiculous. I want you to ask your neighbor, at what point will you quit? Is it the first one, the third one, or the fourth one? I want you guys to continue that conversation even after this. But I want to say that God's kingdom is built on faithfulness. If you read the history of this country, if you read the history of this university, you will find many nameless faithful servants. And I like that we don't know the name of that servant because it wasn't about his name. It was about the mission. When I look at the work we do in Lapid, all God has asked us to do is to be faithful. And let me say it's been hard. When Lapid started, I went and took all my savings, including my pension, and sold it into the organization. I was naive enough to believe that God would use that to reproduce it. So year one went, year two went, year three went, my savings dwindled, and I remember thinking, this is hard. In fact, in 2018, I was ready to quit, and I did for a day. And then I was back. And I say that because unless the Lord helps us, we cannot be faithful. It's not in our own strength. And that's why the prayer is important. God's chosen. The vision God will give you will need you to throw yourself fully to it, to trust him, to make peace with his faithfulness. There is no rain without a faithful servant. And God is asking us today, will you say yes to my call? Will you run seven times to check the rain? Will you trust me enough to say yes, even when you don't see the rain? Will you trust my process? The last point I see in Elijah is rain comes. It comes fast in the form of a little cloud, the size of a man's hand. Can you see it? Can you fathom it? Can you wear eyes of sight? I remember being so exhausted in 2018 and saying, I can't. But I also remember seeing in 2019, God sending the Obama Fellowship. And I was the only Kenyan who was selected for that fellowship. And I knew this is my small cloud. And I was ready for it. The years of sowing, the years of running back and forth had clarified the vision. I had built the muscle to do the work. I was ready. Will you be able to recognize your small clouds? We are a generation that wants perfection. And so we will not recognize the small clouds. God's chosen. Rain comes. God is faithful. But will he find you ready to run like the servants? The seven times of going and checking have prepared you to run when the rain lands. Chosen people of God, I'm here to announce that rain is coming but will it find you ready? And so four things to establish God's kingdom on earth. Purpose, pray, process, progress. Purpose, pray, process, progress. Purpose, pray, process, progress. Where are you in that journey? Have you started to get a sense of purpose? Are you in prayer? Are you trusting the process? And are you in progress? I want to end with one of my favorite verses. Creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. When I hear of Samuel, or Prince Kabu, as I will go with in this university, I hear of a man who came here to find healing. When I hear of Bishop Taylor in Africa, I hear of a man who came to Africa to find healing. When God's kingdom is established on earth, when God's children are revealed, when the chosen say yes, God's kingdom is established on earth. And so I have a dream of a day when Christians in this land will partner with Christians in my land to heal schools, to heal our economics, when we will partner with you to heal your hearts, to heal your city, to establish God's kingdom on earth. Creation awaits us 
Will you say yes? Will you pray? Will you partner with the process? Will you allow progress, not perfection? Rain comes. He is a faithful God. I am the daughter of a phenomenal woman. And if I had time, I'd tell you of all of them, but I don't. <laughs> but they remind me that we are all products of people who've gone before us. So before I left, my mom sent me a quote that I want to read for us. It's a story. It says, it's called, Whose Father Is He? And so a beggar came asking for food. He came to Taylor. He came to another place. And I told him, so this is a story in just context. Somebody has come to some people. He is asking for food. A beggar has come asking for food. I need you to have that picture. So a beggar came asking for food. I told him to come around to the back door and asked him to sit on the floor while I went in to bring the leftover food. I brought him food and said, let's pray. Now repeat after me. So I was teaching him how to pray. Our Father in heaven. And he said, your Father in heaven. I said, no, say our Father in heaven. He said, your Father in heaven. And this extremely irritated me. I asked, why do you say your Father when I say our Father? And he said, sir, it's like this. If I say our Father, then we become brothers. If we are brothers, you would invite me in through your front door not the back door. You would ask me to sit at your dining table, not on the floor. You'd also not give me stale food. Sir, somehow it's not possible. We are sons of the same father. He may be your father, but he can't be our father. Whose father is he? Whose father is he? Establishing God's kingdom on earth with love and by love allows us to show people that he's not your father, he is our father. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I wanna end there and challenge you this week. Purpose, pray, process. God is faithful. Spirit of God, for such a time as this, Father, you have a people here who have said yes. In a time when there is turmoil and there is drought in our world, God, we say yes. We say yes, Lord. Teach us, Father. Help us to see as you see, Lord. Give us a sense of purpose. Teach us to pray and push, Lord. Teach us to celebrate progress, Lord. Teach us to celebrate and embrace process, Lord. I speak a blessing over every chosen generation here in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As they say yes, Lord, lead them to establish your kingdom on earth. For it's in Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. Thank you, Taylor University.